All right, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Liza Matamor. I'm the Strategic Programs Manager at Toronto Arts Council, responsible for um, our innovative programs. Um, I use she, her pronouns and I'm a white woman, fair skinned. I'm wearing dark rimmed glasses. I uh, have long brown hair in a side braid. And I am sitting in front of a gray wall with an ornately framed painting behind me of a French river scape and I'm wearing a gray sweater. Um, I'm going to introduce our interpreters today and ask them to come on and do a little visual description. And then um, I'll also introduce our other co-presenters today, though I won't in have them visually introduce themselves until um, we get to their sections. Um, so if I could turn it over very briefly to Emma and Latasha to introduce yourselves. Hi everyone, my name is Emma. I am one of the ASL interpreters. I'm wearing a black t-shirt. Um, I'm in a bright white room. Um, I am a white woman myself and have long brown hair and a ponytail. Hi everyone, my name is Latasha. I use she, they pronouns. I am the second ASL interpreter for today's session. I am a light-skinned black, black femme. I have two top nut space buns. Um, I'm wearing big black headphones. I have um, orangey yellow um, eyeglasses. I have a jeweled septum septum ring I'm wearing a gray shirt and I have a plain white uh, background thank you both very much um, I'm also going to introduce a little bit later on I'm going to introduce everyone to um, a past participant in this program Sid Nadu from Scarborough Made and Richard Lockman who is the uh, design um, super course instructor um, from the creative school at Ryerson uh, all right, let's see. Oh, right, advancing the slide. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Today we're talking about the Toronto Arts Council and the Creative School at Ryerson University's Digital Solutions Incubator. Um, this is a really unique program um, and collaboration between um, the TAC and the Creative School. Um, it is very, very different than other grant programs that are available through the Toronto Arts Council. Um, because as part of this program, uh, grant recipients will participate as clients for students in the design super course, um, design solution super course, um, at bringing your challenges uh, to students to allow them to explore those challenges using design methodology um, and hopefully propose some prototypes and solutions for your organization. This is unique because it's an exploratory grant um, that is giving you funding that allows you to do exploration into digitally enabled solutions without requiring you to have a final um, product at the end. Um, you will receive $15,000 in funding, but you don't have to provide a budget. Um, and when you come to this program, unlike other grant programs, what you're proposing is a challenge. It's not a project solution. You know, you're not going to come to this program and say, we want to build a website. You're going to say, we're having trouble engaging audiences through our website, and we're looking to um, find solutions to make our website more engaging or to have better um, interactions with um, our audience um, online. The application deadline for the program this year is April 14th. Um, and um, yeah, that I think we'll start there and let's just jump in and talk a little bit about what does this program support? So as I said, this program gives um, organizations and collectives. So it's not open to individuals. It's only open to organizations and collectives. And it provides you with $15,000 in grant funding to tackle your challenges 
um, related to um, digital solutions. Now, it's a little misleading because your, so your problem doesn't necessarily have to be digital in nature. Um, you might have a challenge where you have this incredible alumni database or, or um, alumni who've passed through your organization, but you're having a hard time engaging them or re-engaging them after they've been part of your program. Um, that's not necessarily like a digitally specific challenge, but you can envision digital solutions to that challenge. Um, you know, other challenges might have to do with working remotely, um, you know, as you as we transition to um, hybrid work styles, perhaps your organization has had some challenges um, accessing your resources or um, you know, working in an uh, um, in a remote location. And so again, that's not a specifically digital challenge, but there might be some digital solutions to your challenge. Who should apply for this program? Um, again, this is open to organizations and collectives who are looking to address sort of larger organizational or systemic issues. You might also be looking to address challenges with a particular project, um, but again, it's not going to be a project that's fully formed in your mind, or if it is a project that's ongoing and sort of fully formed, there's some aspect of it that you're needing help with that you don't have the skills um, to address. This program is unique at Ryerson because it's open to students from across different faculties. So you may have students from the communication department, you may have students from the journalism school, you may have students from, from the arts programs, um, from, from um, the design programs. And these students are coming together in small groups um, to explore collaborative solutions using design thinking. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about design methodology and kind of how that system works as we go on today. And certainly Richard will give us a little bit of that insight. Um, the intention of this program is going to be to increase access um, and also to enhance your organizational capacity. Um, you, you may have some really great ideas, but you don't have currently the the team in place or the right expertise to kind of think those things through and this is an opportunity to utilize students expertise um, young people or not so young people who are hopefully um, you know really steeped in um, thinking about uh, the future and thinking about how technology is going to be able to enhance um, and expand access for your audiences for your colleagues uh, and so this is a great opportunity to to put forward some challenges um, that have maybe been plaguing you, but that you've not been able to address through your regular operating funding or through through other funding um, that's available. Because again, most funding that's out there is asking you to um, to have a project, to have something fully formed in your mind. And this is kind of a low risk opportunity to receive some funding to to explore, to think about what the possibilities might be. Um, how are digital approaches defined? As I kind of alluded to, you don't necessarily have to have a digital challenge, but you want to consider that the the expertise of most of the students and what they're coming to this course to learn about is user centered design processes and you want to think about challenges that you can address through digital approaches so it, maybe it's mobile maybe it's web-based augmented reality computer based um, but that you can foresee that there is maybe a digital opportunity um, that you just aren't you aren't clear on exactly what that might be um, the other thing that's important when it comes to this program is understanding the scope of your challenge. Um, it's it's fifteen thousand dollars in funding, so it's not a ton of money. It's not a, you know hundred thousand dollars to build an app, um, and it's not um, necessarily you you want to have something that's scoped appropriately. So something that's that's too narrow, like we want to build a website isn't going to allow the students enough space to explore and think about what the possibilities are. But on the other end, you can't have something that's scoped so broadly that um, there's no place to start. So, you know, we have trouble reaching our audiences online. You need to have something in the middle where you have either you're trying to work within a niche um, stakeholder group or um, you're, you're thinking about, you know, unique opportunities within the work that you're doing. Um, 
So Richard, again, we'll, we'll get into a little bit about the scope and scale of your challenge, but um, that's something, you know, if you have questions throughout the day as we're chatting, feel free to add them to the chat or the QA feature. Um, we'll try to, to answer questions at the end, but it's also something that you can email me, um, you know, or give me a call. My contact information is available on the programs page of the TAC website for this program. And I'm happy to talk through your challenges and to think about what the right scope is. Um, as I said, we provide $15,000 in funding and we don't ask you for a budget. So you're coming to this program with a challenge. So you don't necessarily know exactly what the, the project costs are gonna be or what the, um, the outcome is. And so we've kind of given this rough breakdown on the website, but I think really it, that's just one example. Um, the, the funding is intended to support your time and participation in the course. Um, you're gonna be participating in the course between 10 and 15 hours a month, um, meeting with your student groups, um, talking with them, following up with them. And so you, you, you may want to use some of that funding to support project leads who are going to be doing kind of the heavy lifting. Um, and then you may also have some material costs or direct project costs. Um, this isn't intended to fund capital expenses. But again, at the end, where when you submit your final report, you're not going to be asked how you spent the funding. Um, so if there is equipment that you need in order to move your project forward, that's okay. Um, just can't be stuff that should normally be covered under your operating expenses. Um, I'm just going to go back for a second because I want to talk a little bit about um, just kind of about how you should think about this program and how you should think about um, applying to this program, you you really want to think about, um, you know, what you're able to commit to the program and to um, in terms of um, your your own resources. So, you know, when we talk about who should apply to this program and what is the right scope of project, you want to make sure that whoever is your lead participant in this program is somebody who knows your organization well, somebody who has a, a clear understanding of what it is the organization is hoping to achieve, and that it's somebody that has um, decision making power. You know, this isn't necessarily a project that you want to pass off to, you know, a summer student or interns um, at your organization because. They may not know enough about your operations to actually be able to give the students enough understanding of what kinds of solutions may be right for you. So it's something that you need to have buy in um, from from organizational leadership. Um, if if you know your artistic directors or your executive directors aren't going to be participating directly in the program, who is in the room who has really clear historical knowledge of your organization? and who can make decisions about what the solutions might be. Um, the, the program itself, I'm going to talk in a moment about the timeline of the program, but it also needs to be something that you as a team have enough time to commit to. Um, I think sometimes people think they're coming to this program and these students are going to be able to solve their problem and, and create something. And that's not exactly what this is about. These students, you know, while they are committed to helping you and supporting you in um, in solutions, they also have full course loads outside of this course. And this is, they're approaching this as a case study. Um, so at the end of the semester, you may have a prototype of one idea of um, something that you could implement, but it's not necessarily going to be fully realized and ready to to put into practice. So you might spend, you know, the first semester, September to December in this program, exploring, iterating on ideas, helping students in their research so that they can create a prototype for you um, that then you're going to go out and and actually implement. Alternatively, um, if, if you have a really great dynamic with your students and you want to move forward with them, there is an option for some groups to participate in the second semester. Um, and, and we've also seen other, um, 
other collaborative models where if there was one or a couple of students who worked on your project who you want to bring on um, as a freelancer um, to continue working on that project, you might use some of the funding to support them in, in actualizing on the idea. So this is the timeline of activities. Your applications are due April 14th. You'll receive notifications by the um, midsummer, July-ish. Um, June, July, you'll um, know whether or not you've been successful. And then you'll be participating in the first stage of the program um, between September and December, which, as I said, that runs along um, the same timeline as the um, the first semester design solution super course. And you'll be participating about 10 to 15 hours a month. After December, after the students, there's a showcase in December where the students will put forward their ideas and their prototypes. The second stage is either going to be a continued collaboration or self-directed. So from January to April, you will be trying to move forward. And, and again, you might be moving forward with exactly the idea that the students have proposed. You might be moving forward with an augmented idea, or you might be saying, well, thank you very much for that. You know, that was really insightful. We learned a lot. We still, I think we're going to approach this in a different way. Um, you'll submit your final report in March of next year. And again, your final report is going to be more about your experience in the program than it is going to be about what you actually created. A lot of times this program is kind of that exploratory first step and you may actually go out and seek additional funding to actually implement the, the fulsome um, idea, you know, it's not a ton of funding and it's not a, a long time and so you this may be just an opportunity to do some market research to do some exploration to create a prototype but if you're if the su suggestion is oh you should create a series of podcasts you know that might not be um let's say that's the su the suggestion for your alumni group that you're trying to keep engaged with that i as an example i mentioned earlier you might not create that series of podcasts by the end of this second semester by the by March, but you may have used some of that funding to um, to hire a producer or to look for additional funding that might support you if you decide that's that's the thing that we want to do going forward. I can see that there are some chats and questions. I'm going to look at those um, while some of my colleagues are speaking. I'll try to answer as we go, but we will have time at the end um, to review to review all the questions. Um, and on that note, I'm going to pass uh, the microphone over to uh, Sid from Scarborough Made. Scarborough Made participated in the um, Digital Solutions Incubator last year. And for anyone who doesn't know Scarborough Made, Scarborough Made um, documents the narratives of humanity in Toronto's East by using artistic mediums of photography and cinematography to amplify the voices of underserved neighborhoods. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Sid. And Sid, if you could give a brief visual description of yourself, um, that would be appreciated. Sure. Sorry, I'm actually having a trouble putting the video on. I just realized. That's okay. That's no problem. If you don't sure. need it, we don't need the video. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Eliza, thanks for having me on board, and thank you to the Toronto uh, Arts Council team. Uh, my name is Sid Naidu. I'm a documentary photographer um, and co founder of Scarborough Made. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I, just a quick visual background. I. I'm wearing a black shirt with uh, accent paisley on it. Um, I have a fresh ball fade with a trimmed black beard. And uh, in my background, I have a desktop with a picture with a map of Scarborough and a uh, canvas print of mountains in Hawaii that was taken there. So uh, I just jump back into Scarborough Made. Um, as you heard, Scarborough Made is a social impact project. Um, you know, it's really founded on the idea of documenting stories in underserved communities. And it was really to start championing storytelling in Toronto's East. Uh, my colleague and fellow co-founder, Alex Narvez and myself, uh, we grew up in the East End. And 
what we realized uh, was that there was a lack of stories uh, for the communities that we grew up in. Um, and we wanted to change part of the narrative of how we saw our communities being documented and represented in the media. Uh, so it was, it was something that we often caught where, you know, communities like Scarborough, and I would say the Scarboroughs of the world are, you know, documented or, or portrayed in a certain way um, that wasn't representative of the people here. So we decided to start in 2019 uh, with just the idea of, of going out into the community and documenting people uh, that we knew uh, through personal contacts um, and through organizations that we've worked with. Uh, and it evolved into this, you know, what we have today as the Scarborough Made Project, which is an artist collective, uh, it does public art installations, uh, it does a creative mentorship program. And I'd say prior to when we started in 2019, uh, you know, really all our work was self-funded. Uh, it was self-directed. So when we started, you know, working uh, with Toronto Arts Council and kind of putting forth applications uh, to look at these solutions, uh, we, we really had the opportunity to kind of really propel our work and, and grow. So I just, just a little bit, I wanted to share about, you know, kind of what our, our mission and purpose was for Scarborough Made. Um, and then, you know, I'm going to dive into kind of the problem and, and challenges that we presented. So uh, when we put forth our application, we put it forth on this idea of, of um, making storytelling more accessible. Uh, and that was two reasons. When we started in 2019, we, it was really, we have a run and gun style. We do photography and cinematography, uh, and we would just go out into the community, you know, connect with people and we would document the story. Uh, and that was primarily just my colleague, Alex Narvis and myself, uh, who would go capture these stories through, uh, through video and, and photography. Um, we realized, you know, while that was good for us starting off and, you know, really developing a concept and, and testing out this idea and creating stories, uh, it didn't really allow for us to capture the full scope of, of Scarborough, uh, which is a, you know, a big space uh, and all the communities that we wanted to connect with. So we started to ask ourselves, you know, how do we make storytelling more accessible? And that's when we, you know, decided to kind of put forth this application and grant. And, and it, it revolved around two specific areas. Um, you know, how do we collect stories, uh, you know, as storytellers who are from these communities, how do we go in and, and collect stories to, you know, represent the diversity that's there? Uh, the first year that we started documenting, we had stories, um, as an example, we had Maestro Fresh West, Canadian hip hop pioneer, um, who, you know, wrote his hit song that's in the Hall of Fame, Let Your Backbone Slide uh, in Parkway Mall. Uh, so we had a story like that, um, all the way to a story uh, like uh, the late Doris Sneddon, who's a 105 year old resident uh, who lived in Scarborough and kind of saw uh, Scarborough come up uh, during that time. So we were capturing diversity, but we, we really knew that we still had more to do. Um, so when you put forth this uh, problem, uh, the, the, for the digital solution, it was really asking ourselves something that we wanted to tackle, but we realized we couldn't do alone. Uh, we, you know, as an artist collective, we typically tackle multiple projects. So uh, being able to put this forward as an idea it really allowed us to evolve and start to, to think through the process. So when we did uh, kind of get accepted into the program uh, and we started to, you know, roll out and, and work with the students, it was a great experience trying to understand, you know, what actually this, uh, solution could be and how do we make storytelling accessible um, from a design thinking perspective and, and the students took the lead in that and I think that was really important for us uh, well the the year that we, we were implementing was last year and we had a massive um, increase in terms of our programming we had two public art installations a creative mentorship program uh, but we still wanted to you know really tackle this idea because we felt it would grow so Having the students on board, you know, we would meet with them, uh, you know, based on their schedules, uh, and we would connect with them to really try to understand what this problem could mean and give them some direction. And what was cool was that we also had the students also participate in some of the programming that we had because we had live programming last year. Uh, they attended some of uh, the events, the public art installations that we did in the film screenings to kind of get to know our audience and our, our uh, you know, people who participate in our program from the youth. Uh, to a team to understand what exactly Scarborough Made is, uh, who really looks at it. And I think, I believe that's what kind of really helped out the direction. Um, so when they went through uh, the process of, of really unpacking, uh, you know, what we were trying to accomplish, we, we had ideas of, you know, what we could accomplish, but we didn't know the direction. So they really helped us move in a direction of how we wanted to make storytelling more accessible. And uh, what it resulted in was a solution that was presented 
uh, about kind of the storytelling that we have and how to share it in one way, uh, which was a map, uh, being able to build a visual map of where we've documented stories in Scarborough uh, that we're actually implementing right now. Um, so, you know, we're building this map on our, our website. We're doing almost a little bit of an overhaul uh, to make, uh, to kind of show where we've documented stories. And uh, from a creator angle, we can then see the communities that we haven't necessarily documented and then allocate maybe future projects towards working in certain communities um, or, you know, touch base with community organizations there to see if they could uh, connect us with stories. The second part of that was finding out how do we submit stories. So uh, what was pitched was, you know, that ability and the solution that was presented was being able to have people self-submit stories, uh, which I think was important for us because it really opens up the opportunity for us to then do a deeper dive into understanding different story threads. Um, I will also say when we, we wrote the application, we very much wrote it, you know, uh, during the pandemic where it was about sharing the story of BIPOC communities and the impacts that they were facing during the pandemic itself. Uh, our team last year was resilience. And what we realized that this solution, while we, we try to build it around, you know, certain things that we experienced, um, it really kind of allowed us to now grow into something different where we could, you know, take on different projects and have this as an as a added element uh, to have user generated stories uh, from those communities. Um, I'm seeing if there's anything else. Yeah, so the solution, you know, that was presented is something that we're working on right now, actually, uh, to kind of implement. Uh, we, we wrapped up with the students uh, last year and, you know, we, we, we kind of sat with this idea a little bit to figure out what will work for us. Um, so it was cool. And I'd say the benefit of this is, is that I don't think we would have been able to actually tackle this as an idea. Uh, without the funding from Toronto Arts Council, uh, to be honest, because with the number of projects we typically take on as freelancers, uh, it became something that, you know, it's nice to have, uh, but it may not be something that we can implement until we have the resources to do so. Now that we've been able to get this funding, you know, we are doing an overhaul kind of, of how we present the stories on this map. Uh, we've been able to take all our stories and put it on YouTube uh, to make sure that there's closed captioning on there. So it's accessible in that sense. Um, and then now we're also implementing this idea of like having forms where people can submit stories uh, for different themes that we run every year. And that would essentially allow us to maybe capture some of the stories for a deeper dive or even maybe have them submit an image where we can share the stories on social media. So uh, in terms of the scale of how it allowed us to grow uh, in terms of a, you know, a digital way where most of our content, yeah, I think we are more of a digital platform we're moving in that direction. It really kind of helped us shape in that direction. And I think the students who are, able to take the lead and, you know, kind of help us understand a little bit of that direction. That was essential. I don't think we would have moved in this direction if it wasn't for that feedback and, you know, for them also kind of presenting their ideas. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of an overall scope, I hope that kind of prese uh, presented somewhat of an idea of, uh, you know, what we did last year uh, with Scarborough made uh, through the Digital Solutions Incubator. And I, I would 100% say it's, it's one of those projects that really allows you to explore those possibilities of, of something that you probably wanted to tackle for some time. Uh, but, you know, you're just, you're looking for that extra push or support in terms of how to get there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sid. Um, I just have got notified that when I was trying to answer questions, it was bringing up a gray box um, in front of the screen. So I'm going to wait uh, to try to answer questions at the end. So please continue to add your questions or thoughts in the chat. Um, and we'll we'll try to get to them at the end. And similarly, you can also add questions um, in the Q and A or the chat for Sid if you have any specific questions um, for Sid or for Richard, who's going to be coming up here soon. Um, you're welcome to add those questions um, for them as well. All right. So as I've mentioned, this is a partnership with Ryerson um, University through the Creative School. Um, you you will be participating in the design solutions super course as a client of a group of students. Um, there will be about six or seven um, projects from this grant program, so it's a relatively small program. Um, you know, we'll get once our uh, the applications are submitted, we will choose between six or seven um, applicants uh, to participate. And successful applicants will have access to those students through the first semester to explore their solutions using digital thinking and technology. Um, it's about a 10 to 15 hour a month commitment for September to December. 
And then in the second semester, some groups may have the option to continue on with those students in the second semester um, design super course, but most groups will continue on um, independently. You will have the option, um, you know, as I said, you can kind of take it your um, take it from there. In some instances, we have seen organizations actually hire individual or groups of students who participated in the first semester um, to bring them into the organization um, on a contract to try to implement the ideas. Um, we've seen that with some past projects. Um, but you also might decide, you know, we're going to go out into the marketplace and find, um, you know, an expert um, who's going to help us implement this. You might take this on and try to implement sort of some of the ideas on your own. Um, and, and at the end of the day, um, we're going to be asking you more about your experience um, within the course and within the program than we are about what you've created. Yes, ideally, you will create something, um, but it may be a preliminary step, especially if what's been proposed is something quite large um, or something that's going to be an ongoing project, um, you know, similar to what Scarborough made um, did. This is this has influenced um, and informed future projects. And so while there may be um, an outcome that you can speak about um, through this, this program itself, this program is really emphasizing the exploration. Um, I'm now going to share a brief video from Richard um, talking about the course and talking about um, this program. And then we'll hear from Richard directly. Hi, my name is Richard Lachman. I'm an associate professor in the RTA School of Media at Ryerson University, and I'm also the director of Zone Learning, which is our network of incubators at the university that spans everything from engineering through to the creative arts. I'm also the teacher of a course called the Design Solution Super Course that's part of the Toronto Arts Council grant that you're hopefully thinking of applying for. So I wanted to describe to you a little bit more about how the grant you're looking at connects with students at Ryerson so you can determine if it's a good match uh, for what you're going to uh, propose. So as I said, the course is called the Design Solution Super Course. And essentially, we connect your organization with a team of four or five students from across the university. They can be in any program, although most of our students tend to come from a communications, creative, or design background. Uh, that team will be connected with you as a client. And the program is really about trying to help strategic planning and prototyping or helping your organization solve some sort of problem or challenge that you have. The way I like to describe this is if you know exactly what it is you want to do, for example, we need a website that does X, Y, and Z. This isn't a good match for you. You should go ahead and hire someone to build that for you or get an intern. This program is really about determining some more poorly defined problem. Maybe it's a challenge you're having and you don't really know the solution. Maybe it's a new area you want to explore engaging in. Uh, it could be a new technology. It could be a new audience. It could be a new set of problems that your organization is facing. Uh, you will put forward a client challenge, basically a one paragraph description of something you're interested in. And again, it's not exactly we need X. It's we're interested in this area or we're not sure how to explore this new challenge. COVID-19, for example, is producing a whole range of challenges that this kind of program is a good match for. So as I said, it's not over-specified. It should focus on a real audience or a real uh, set of users that you want to engage with. The students will go through a 12-week structured design thinking approach. They'll spend time with you and your organization understanding more about what it is you do, what your needs are. They'll spend time with the people directly affected by whatever your problem area is. It might be an audience, it might be a set of users, it might be some specific people in your own organization, or it might be a new audience or a new set of users for your organization. Uh, now, when I say spend time with, in the ordinary version of this course uh, and this grant program, students get off campus and they will come to your offices or they would spend time directly with anyone affected by the challenge area. In the time of COVID-19, we can't do that. So most likely this will be done through Zoom, where they will do structured interviews, they'll do uh, needs finding, needs assessment, conversations with you and the people you identify. They will then go ahead and determine a 
a specific problem they want to focus on. So of this larger challenge area, we think we'd like to engage with X. Uh, they'll run that by you, get your feedback and buy-in, maybe find out from you who else they should be talking to. And then they'll try and focus on an exact solution and they'll prototype that solution. So it kind of goes in this double diamond approach where they go starting with a challenge, what are all the various ways this might affect something? And they'll focus in on here's an exact problem we'd like to work on. Then they'll go on wide on a number of solutions and then they'll focus in on an exact prototype and they'll show that to you and get your feedback on that. Uh, usually we then have an end of year showcase where of all the different clients that are focused and part of this class, uh, they can learn a little bit more and you can see what other solutions and other problems were proposed. Uh, the details from your side is in addition to whatever proposal you put forward to the Toronto Arts Council, we in the course are looking for a single paragraph that describes uh, a challenge and one person who can be the lead contact person from your organization. You then attend a, a online pre-meeting in August where I meet with all of the clients and answer any problems and questions and describe to you how the semester will go. You'll find out when you're matched with a student uh, group uh, sometime early in September, probably in week two of uh, running the course. And then they'll have a client meeting with you probably in week three, which is about mid to late September. They'll then have a couple of meetings with you over the course of the semester, including check-ins. You can get as much or as little out of this as you put in. So the minimum request is that they have three meetings of one hour over the course of 12 weeks. Some of your organizations might actually want more of that. Uh, so you might want to meet on a more reasonable basis. Uh, in terms of being clear about expectations, students who are enrolled in this course, it is one of five courses they're likely taking. They are not full time on this. They are not paid. Uh, on this. So it is a course, they are very dedicated, they will put a lot of time in, but just to be reasonable on they can't meet with you every day, they probably can't meet with you twice a week. Uh, some of our partners, so Toronto Arts Council grant supports arts organizations for working with our students, but we also work with corporate clients and government clients. So in the past we'd work with TD Bank, the Four Seasons Hotel chain, uh, many branches of the Ontario provincial government from education to agriculture. Uh, we've worked with the Allen Gardens, we've worked with Walmart, uh, we've worked with nonprofits like uh, a Canadian Refugee Resettlement Organization, as well as the CBC, CanStage, uh, dance organizations and cultural organizations. Uh, so again, when you're thinking of an area, it's something not too specific and not too vague. Um, the students also are not necessarily specialized, so they're not always, I can't guarantee you'll get a programmer or a finance major or a business major. Uh, we try and match students based on their interests as an interdisciplinary team from anything from journalism through ge geography uh, to English to performance, uh, depending on what your organization's needs are. You need to be available to be involved. So if you're thinking this is a great grant, but I'll hand it off to someone else in my organization who doesn't really know uh, what this is about, that tends not to work so well. It's got to be someone from your organization who really is committed to helping and getting the most value out of this program. Um, so just quickly to outline a few potential projects that we've dealt with in the past. Once uh, a number of years ago, we had an organization that wanted to match journalism with live, uh, live uh, performance. So we had a student team that had a few performers, a few journalists involved, uh, being able to prototype what an, a live digital uh, and real life magazine might look like, uh, covering connecting investigative journalism with live performance. We've had uh, students worked with the Ministry of Transportation on modernizing the driver's handbook. And so students, because they had the skills, some of them uh, by, by just happenstance, were able to build a prototype of a video game that covered a lot of the material in the driver's handbook. And that represented a new strategic approach for the Ministry of Transportation. We worked with Archives Ontario, where the archives wanted to get more people involved with the content and materials they support as an archive. A student team was able to prototype a story uh, a live walking tour based on one of the stories hidden in the archives about the Great Toronto Fire. And students were able to prototype uh, a live action, walk through the city collection of storytelling images and graphics. Uh, we worked with an organization, a dance advocacy organization, and they were interested in exploring how young chore uh, choreographers might not know a lot about documenting their work. And that documenting in terms of archive is very different than documenting in social media. So they wanted to explore how do we help young 
choreographers understand that just posting something to Instagram is not the same way as building an archive that could last 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And so students devised an advocacy campaign. They spent time understanding the problem. They spent time with the potential population of young choreographers and came up with a, a marketing campaign, advocacy campaign, which uh, then the organization was able to take the Toronto Arts Council grant, hire professional designers, and then actually implement that, uh, that campaign. We also worked with a cultural organization, a cultural center that had a physical place. And their problem was, how do we get a younger audience to come out to our physical location? And so the student team uh, were able to put together a, a, a set of uh, proposals for uh, events they might be able to run over the course of a year, prototype some of those and come up with some of the design criteria. So that's just a quick outline of some of the kinds of uh, events, organizations, problems and challenges. The way we think about this uh, is it's got to be something where you're looking for strategic advice or a new area to work in. And the output is a prototype, not a fully fledged launch, but it could be a marketing campaign design. It could be a strategy document. It could be a campaign design uh, or it could be a needs assessment. Uh, and they're able to spend time with you and find out in a coherent way what next steps might be uh, for you from a strategy point of view. So I'm going to leave that there. Uh, I hope you do apply. We are welcome to a f huge range of kinds of organizations. And we really think the crises facing the arts uh, sector means that it's a good time to spend the time on strategy if you can. And this grant is a perfect match for it. So I invite you to direct any questions directly to the Toronto Arts Council. They might be able to hand some off to me if you have questions about applying. Uh, and there will be some more uh, information uh, exchanges and chances for you to ask questions in the coming weeks. Thanks a lot. All right. Oh, uh oh, fun. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry about that. My uh, my Z YouTube link just continued on there. Okay, let's go back to our presentation. Um, I now like to invite Richard um, to come on screen, um, give a visual description if you're able to Richard and then maybe if you have a few words that you'd like to add um, to what you shared in the video. I love that video. I think it gives such a Hi, um, my name is Richard Latchman. Great in uh, intro Hi, my to name the is program. Uh, hi, everyone. If I could get uh, my video is not able to share right now. If someone could, uh... Oh, OK. Um, Gusimran, are you able to um, make Richard a um, a host so that he can share? Yeah. Yeah, Richard, you are good. OK. Uh, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Latchman. I'm a um, male Indo-Caribbean uh, with a beard and glasses that someone with much better taste than I has picked out for me. Uh, I'm in an office uh, environment uh, in front of a bookcase. Um, it's nice to meet you all. I won't, uh, I think the video and, uh, and Liza have done a, a job of explaining the details of this. Maybe I'll just touch on a couple of things and then open myself up to questions from you. Uh, hopefully that's all clear. I know it's a lot of information to throw at you. The video is available on YouTube, so you can review it again later if you're trying to figure out if it's a good match for you. Uh, the few things I'll point out are one, to reiterate, um, there are a huge number of kinds of outputs that can come from this because some of the questions in the chat have been about that. So the, the basic understanding is, no, this is not a team of experts who will build exactly a fully functioning thing for you in 12 weeks that you can put online. That's probably unlikely to happen. Uh, they can help you explore of all the different approaches you could have to this question, what's the best one? So they can do some of this core research. They do spend a lot of time going out and talking to people. So you might not have had a chance to talk to a new audience for your works, or you might not have had time to go through the 10 possible online platforms that might help. Uh, you reach an audience online or maybe internally, uh, or your organization might wanna have a better communication strategy for your volunteers. Uh, so what the students can do is talk to those volunteers, for example, or talk to that new audience member. They'll do interviews with your team and uh, outside, and they'll say of all the different ones, here's the best recommendation. Uh, and that's in 12 weeks, what can be done. 
Uh, I can't promise the skill set they have. In other words, they're not going to be five programmers yet, probably. Uh, you might, we do our best to match, but if you're a, a theater company, we might give you one school of performance student, two journalists, uh, a, a creative, um, a creative industry student and a geographer. They will use the skills they have. Uh, they can be any year from first year to grad student. So it's a mix of people, a mix of perspectives. Uh, and that's kind of the strength of this, but it means they're not all experts in one domain. Um, and then the outputs, as I say, is what they can build in 12 weeks. You can then take that and take it further. Um, and as Liza was saying, we've had organizations hire the students to keep working on it and use the grant that way. We've had students, we've had uh, organizations take the money and then use it to implement. We've had organizations that maybe are mostly volunteer and they've paid themselves to have the time to engage in strategy. Uh, because when you're working project grant to project grant, we know it's really hard to take the time. Uh, all, all of this range of things are, are possible. You don't have to pay the students, the students get credit. So that's um, that's the side there. Uh, someone did have a question about intellectual property. Uh, and the way I answer this is the same way with arts organizations as I do a corporate uh, or startups we've worked with or government, which is the policy at X university is that students co-own everything they make, which means if there's an idea that's generated about, about this, your organization is free to work with that idea. Students are free to work with that idea. Um, if this is something so precious, you need an NDA or so, you know, it's gonna make you millions of dollars somehow, don't share it with this program. Uh, it means if that's something you need to protect in some way, you're going to have to find another way to, to, to focus this. The open innovation approach that we use here and in a lot of our incubation programs is that sharing ideas is a way to make them stronger. Uh, that is the policy of the institution as well. Uh, they're getting a credit, but they're getting the, the lessons learned from working with organizations. You're getting the value of the students and, and in this case, a cash grant, uh, but anyone's free to work with the ideas in that way. So again, if it's something you have to protect, maybe think of a different idea for this, this project. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any other questions. Um, yeah, so maybe what, oh, the last thing I'll say is that video was made a year ago in the middle of COVID. Right now, I can't say what the COVID policies of the institution will be. We are open and back on campus now for the most part. Um, the strength of this is often the students who are in person have conversations and we teach that is a methodology here as part of the design methodology of getting off campus, getting out of a, a room and going and talking to the people directly affected by the designs. Uh, we couldn't do that. So a lot of it was online during COVID. In the fall, my hope is we'll be able to run this course as we normally do. But if the institution or the province says you can't do in person, of course, that's what we'll do. Uh, and we won't push students to move beyond their own comfort levels. But the hope is that we actually can have them come to your offices, if you have offices, go out and maybe observe, as um, as, uh, as Sid was saying, some of the events you might be running and learn that way, because that is the, the heart of the course. So maybe I'll just open it up, uh, Liza, unless you have anything else to direct questions that uh, that I can talk about. I just want to. We we will open it up to questions. I'm just going to go um, through a couple more um, slides related to accessibility in the accessibility grant. But then, yes, we will we'll we'll turn it over to questions in just a couple of minutes. Um, so just give me one second. Reshare the presentation. Okay, so we just got um, one or two more more things that I want to chat about um, this program and I think one of somebody's just asked about this in the chat so good timing. Um, <coughs> excuse me, this program is also available, um, you can apply for TAC's accessibility grant as part of this program, so this would be something that you apply for at the same time that you apply for the digital solutions incubator. The TAC has an accessibility grant that will provide up to a maximum of $5,000 towards accessibility costs for artists incurred during the project. Now, I want to be very clear 
that right now the accessibility grant at TAC is limited to supporting artists involved with the project. So deaf, disabled artists, artists who identify as having mental illness or needing support um, who are going to be lead contributors to your project. So as an example, um, Nightwood Theater uh, participated in this program a couple of years ago. They wanted to, um, they have a mandate as part of their um, their strategic plans that they wanted to increase accessibility, but it was something that they hadn't been able to tackle. They came to this program with the challenge of wanting to engage more with accessibility and part uh, and they also hired um, a, a an accessibility consultant to be a contributing collaborator on this project. They applied for the accessibility grant funding to support that um, individual who was um, who identified as blind and they ultimately created a blind artists and audiences theaters toolkit, um, which was a separate web page plug in and was ultimately built by one of the students who participated in the course um, with contributions from um, their blind consultant. So they used the accessibility funding to support the participation of that consultant in this program in the course and also in um, implementing and putting out um, their toolkit. But the funding cannot be used for the public facing component of your project. So if, for example, you have an idea where you want to engage deaf audiences, anything that you put out as part of the output of the project that's geared towards your audiences or your constituency that has to be funded through the project funding itself this additional five thousand dollars is intended to support accessibility costs for participants who are leading the project um, and i'm happy to answer more questions about that if you have any um, as well, TAC likewise provides accessibility support for applications itself. So if you identify as deaf, um, disabled, or living with mental illness, and you need support to complete the grant application, you can access up to $500 per year to cover the cost of assistance for support service providers. Um, this would be if you need someone to help you write the grant, um, or someone who's going to help do some transcription for you in advance of submitting the grant, you would notify me as soon as possible by email that you need that support. I would approve it and then you would hire your support service provider. They would invoice the TAC directly and we will pay for that cost to assist you in submitting your application. Um, I'm going to talk really quickly about the assessment process. Um, the panel assesses projects according to the following criteria. Um, they're looking at the artistic merit. They're looking at the demonstrated capacity of the applicants to carry out the project as outlined. Financial viability of the project. Um, it's, you know, it's not really relevant for this program because you don't provide a budget for this program. Um, but the main thing for this program is that Richard is one of our panelists. We will also put together a group of artists, some past participants, um, uh, individuals who have digital design expertise within the artistic community. Um, and what they're really going to be looking at are your challenges. Are your challenges appropriately scoped? Is this something that students are going to realistically be able to help you with to create a prototype for um, and explore? So again, it kind of comes back to the size and scope of your challenge, something that's not too specific with a, a preordained outcome and something that's not so vast and so broad that the students are not going to be able to meaningfully engage with that. Those are the primary areas and criteria of assessment for this program. Um, people have been asking about who's eligible. Um, as I said, this program is open to art, um, arts organizations and collectives. You can need to either be a nonprofit organization um, or a collective, and you have to have a mandate um, within the arts. So this is not a program that's open to um, uh, just every not-for-profit, you need to be an arts organization or collective. Um, here's just a general list of grant writing tips. Um, I'm absolutely happy to connect with anyone, um, especially if you reach out to me in the next couple of weeks with a draft before the deadline and you're hoping that I'll take a look at it. 
I'm more than happy to do so. I can give you some general feedback on, you know, the scope of your challenge um, and things like that. Um, but as always, read the guidelines carefully, make sure that you're eligible, make sure your project is a strong fit for the deadlines and objectives. Be in touch with me, especially if you're not that familiar with this program. Let's have a conversation, send me an email, let's talk about your idea. Um, the deadline is coming up, um, it's, it's April 14th, so make sure you take some time. Um, it's not a particularly onerous application because you aren't submitting a budget, but you do want to give yourself time to compile, um, you know, CVs and bios for your lead um, program contributors, for example. Um, it's always a good idea to work on your draft in a separate document. You will be submitting your grant application through the online portal, um, but certainly there have been instances where the portal is glitchy and so you may need to, um, you know, you want to be able to continually save and keep working on your application. Really use clear and direct language. Always, as with any strategic program, this grant is open to, um, to organizations from across the artistic disciplines. Um, so you're a theater organization, you're a dance organization, you are a visual arts organization. That means that the panel that's comprised is going to be likewise general. There's going to be some individuals who come from the theater community, from the dance community, from the music community. You don't want to get too bogged down um, in jargon or things that are related really, um, you know, that only an insider would have understanding of because you may not, your panel may not be fully versed in that, um, in that world. So you wanna just make sure that you're using simple language, it's straightforward, it's succinct, um, and recognizing that your audience, your panel, the panel who's going to be assessing your grant um, may not be from your artistic discipline. It's not like applying to a project grant through the music stream or through the dance stream. Um, and kind of tying in with that, I think it's always a good idea to get feedback from somebody out, either outside of your organization or outside of your artistic discipline who can kind of ask you those questions about whether things make sense, um, whether everything is clear. You know, you want your application to be memorable. You want to tell us a story. Um, I think last year, one of our panelists said something great, which was about how to approach these challenges. Um, you know, let's say you have a challenge that's a bit broader, um, how to re-engage your in-person audience online or something. If you've got a broad challenge like that, you want to give us some trailheads. You want to give the students some places of, that they can jump off from. Um, so think about what those trailheads might be for, for a bigger challenge. Um, and make sure you follow all the instructions, complete all of the sections of the grant, and just triple check. Um, one thing I didn't mention about this grant, which may be relevant to some people, is that the Digital Solutions Incubator um, is part of a category in and of itself. So if you are familiar with applying to grants at the TAC, you may know that you're generally limited to applying to one discipline grant and one strategic grant per year. The great thing about this program is it doesn't count towards your strategic grant total. So you can apply for this grant and also apply for Open Door, for example, or Artists in the Libraries or Animating Historic Sites. This grant does not um, count as your one strategic grant for the year. It's a unique opportunity, a unique grant, so it sort of lives in its own category. I think that's it for um, the slideshow presentation today. So we're going to just go ahead and jump right into some questions and comments. I'm going to go back to the beginning of the comment reel and see if there are some that I can answer. But first, um, Sid, there was a question that came in for you specifically um, in the uh, Q&A section. So maybe if you're still with us, you can hop on. The question is, do, 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 I have, just have to find it. Um, mm -hmm, one opened. Sorry if I missed this, but for Scarborough Made, what was the allocated grant and what exactly was it used for? Staff payment resources, question mark? So they're wondering how you use the funding. Yeah, um, I can break that down. Um, can everybody hear me? Just my mic's on. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so we allocated, we, we kind of took the recommendations from Toronto Arts Council uh, in terms of allocations um, for having uh, both uh, myself uh, and uh, my colleague Alex Narvez, and another team member, uh, kind of be work with the students through the process of determining the solution and then working on actually figuring out how we can implement the prototype this year. Uh, so roughly yeah, that percentage of, of uh, I think it was 10,000 was what we allocated in terms of the project leads. So we had three project leads. We were more involved in this process uh, because we're an artist collective, you know, we're a small team. So we're very lean in terms of how we operate. Uh, and then what we did was we put uh, the 5,000 amount towards actually uh, developing the actual solution, which we're working on right now. Um, I don't know if that helped answer the question, but that was the allocation that we specifically looked at. And one thing that we realized was um, we're not able to typically take on a lot of projects because that sustainability of being able to work uh, true to solutions can be you know, time consuming when you're doing you know, three to four grants a year, uh, plus other freelance projects. So this allowed us to give us that time so we could actually meet with the students, plus also work as a team to you know, have discussions and feedback of, of what will work. Uh, I want brainstorming sessions of you know, what we could have implemented after we did work with the students. And uh, of course, the component now where we're able to work with a coder uh, to develop that map component that we, I discussed uh, slightly about. All those factors in allowed us to you know, stretch uh, this project from you know, last semester into this year and actually have us on board in a sustainable way. Awesome. Thank you, Sid. I hope that answered your question, but please feel free um, to add anything in the chat. Um, let me just make sure my camera's on. Sorry about that. Um, okay, I'm just going to go through and start reading through some of these questions. Um, a couple of them were answered um, uh, via the Q&A chat, but I'm going to just review them because others might have similar questions. Um, somebody asked um, if organizations receiving TAC operating funding are eligible to apply. The answer is yes. Yes, you are. Um, you may want to speak with your um, operational funding program manager, um, but I believe that for all operating clients, you are still eligible to apply to one project grant per stream. Again, this one doesn't count towards your total. Um, for the strategic program, so you could still apply to this and another project grant. It operates the same as other project funding, um, but you are eligible to apply to this. Um, somebody asked about the students uh, being paid. You're not paying fees to the students as part of the course, um, but you, as we've mentioned a couple times, you are eligible to um, to engage students after the fact. Of course, you know that's at their um, uh, discretion or their capacity, if students are interested in being engaged, um, you are able to do so. Um, let's see, if we have an innovation idea and the students found the solution, realizing it, who owns the IP? Again, I think Richard already touched on this. Um, you know, intellectual property, um, it's kind of a gray area. Anything that you create as your organization ideally would be your um, proprietary ownership. Um, but certainly if you were engaging students, that's something that you could work out with them. Um, but if you're if you're providing the financial resources um, and and hosting um, the the prototype or, or hosting the um, say it's a website or something that would be that would be owned by you um do 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 let's just see okay it can be strategy okay let's see i'm just looking through um, so somebody asked specifically about the accessibility grant about can it be um, meant for deaf hearing impaired artists or can it be applied for organizations wanting to create solutions. So as I kind of alluded to in um, my comment, the accessibility grant itself is intended to support lead project co collaborators. So if you're creating something for the public, um, for, for deaf um, or hearing impaired communities, you may want to engage um, a deaf consultant on the project and you could support that deaf consultant um, with ASL interpreters who would attend um, your sessions with students um, 
but it would not it would not cover um, the solutions created for your public audience. And I think that's all the questions in the chat. And I'm just going to go through. There were a couple of really good ones in the Q and A. Um, organizations that have received digital solutions funding before. Um, if you go through the guidelines, you'll see that organizations are eligible to receive this funding once every two years. But as with all grants that you receive through the TAC, you are not eligible to receive additional funding for a grant that's already been funded. So. Um, you know, you mentioned in your question, Lorraine, about wanting to continue and learn more about implementing and use the advice recommended that they provided. You would need to frame your submission as a new challenge. Um, I think that you probably could do that through the digital solutions incubator. You might say, like, you know, we, we, took this project to this stage now we're looking to continue on or um, expand on our learning and learn you know our new challenge is x but you can't come back to the program with the exact same challenge that you've already received funding for and that's true across all tac grants if you receive um, project funding through open door, for example, to create um, a digital hub, you can't come to the digital solutions incubator and receive additional funding for that project. You can receive funding for an ancillary, an ancillary component or something that's not covered in your operating budget, but you can't, you can't double dip essentially. So you'd have to frame it as a new challenge or um, the next steps or a new phase of a project. Um, it's so this is the question it's more of a research based project, not so much a co op internship opportunity with that said, is there a prerequisite for students to complete implementation to or can the end research summary findings i'm not entirely sure, but Richard, I think, has kind of answered that one as part of the course, you may have kind of a research summary. Um, you you may um, you you want to provide the students with an opportunity to talk to real people um, to gain insights through talking to audiences experts and users or community members you don't want them to be doing just a purely um, library based research project um, and and at, likewise at the end of this program you may have a fully realized finished product if it's something that is easily implementable, um, you know, the things like the blind audiences and theaters toolkit was something that was actually created after this program, you know, there was a prototype or a recommendation made by students, the organization went back and then engaged someone to actually build that. In other cases, you may realize, okay, this is a great idea. We're going to take this to the next step, but we're, we're not going to be able to create the full project through this funding. We're going to we're going to use this as an opportunity to look for additional funding. Example there would be the alumni organization or the organization that I mentioned that um, was looking to engage their alumni. Um, the recommendation from the students and the prototype that they put forward was to do a series of podcasts. Um, and so the, the the organization was really interested in that, but it wasn't something that they were able to implement fulsome, you know, in a fulsome way through this program. Um, they they then went on and sought additional funding to start that initiative. Somebody asked about applying with more than one potential challenge and letting the students choose. You don't want to do that. You want to figure out what your challenge is and apply with one challenge. The students aren't going to be um, empowered to make a decision on your behalf. They don't review your application. So if you don't have a clear challenge that you're putting forward in your application, they're not um, you're, you're not going to receive the funding. The panel is going to make a determination um, and then you're going to write if you're selected, you're going to write your challenge with Richard's help out in a sort of one paragraph summary that the students will receive when they're determining which groups they want to work in, but they're not going to be deciding between multiple options. What if we ask, what if they ask the what if what the organization asks is beyond the skills being developed by the students? For example, we want to work on developing an NFT. 
Is there a way of knowing exactly what the skills and limitations are? So this is a great example. You already have a solution. You don't have a challenge. You want to develop an NFT. That's the answer to the question. You should go out, hire someone who has expertise in NFTs and go ahead and build that. Um, there's no way to know what the specific skills are of the students. They're coming from across um, different departments. You may have some students, and I don't think it's unlikely, you may have some students who are really interested in NFTs and they can do research and reach out to other experts and learn about it. Um, but you won't be guaranteed that. And you'll have to frame your challenge in a way that says, NFTs might be a possible outcome for our for what we want to do, but it's not the challenge. The challenge can't be we want to learn about NFTs. That's that's too focused on a solution. Um, the next question I think is just relevant to this one organization about whether they're eligible. I encourage everyone here. I shared in the chat already the link to the program page. Be sure to download the guidelines. Make sure that you're eligible. If you have questions about your eligibility, email me. Um, again, you know, this question of we'd like to develop our team and update our website. Updating your website isn't a great challenge for this program. Um, it's you're you're already kind of focused on a solution. Um, you know, you could probably broaden that in some way. Um, and maybe Richard might have some ideas there, but just saying we want to update our website. The, these students are not um, uh, web designers for hire. Um, they're, they're primarily interested in learning how to use design methodology to, to, to um, uh, create solutions for challenges. So you, you might have something a little bit broader there that might be the solution might be to update your website, but that can't, that's not the challenge in and of itself. What you need there is to hire a developer, a web developer who can work on your website. And then somebody asked again about, are these students open to future recruitment with the organization they made the project for, um, especially if in their final year? And I know Richard wants to chat about that. Hi. Uh Sorry, yeah, uh, absolutely. There, there are all kinds of outputs for this. So some students have a thesis in their program, so they might want to work on their thesis project with the organization as a capstone project. Um, they can be a summer intern that you fund through any other program. Sometimes they're volunteers. Any of these, uh, any outcome is possible. So it is potentially a chance to find students who are interested in the work you're doing or learn about the work you're doing to continue that relationship. All of those outputs have, uh, have happened. All right, that is the end of the questions as I see them. We do have a few more minutes. Um, if there are anybody else who has any other questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat now um, or add them to the Q&A. 